Welcome to the Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design. I'm Gretchen Marie Schaefer. I'm the director of REMCAD's Visiting Artist, Scholar, and Designer program. The VASD program is an interdisciplinary initiative that values passionate curiosity and explores critical, diverse, and creative inquiry through a variety of events and presentations. Um, we're very happy to further enrich the academic experience for all of our students here at the college and to serve the greater Denver metro community. This evening's presentation is the second in the VASD program's year-long fiction series, which investigates the complicated relationship between contemporary artists and veracity. In broad swaths of contemporary life and culture, notions of shared objective truths are currently being challenged and blurred in new ways. However, there's a long and rich history of artworks that intentionally mislead and falsify. In this in the context of art, these illusions are permitted, even expected and desired, and often wield the hoax as an instrument for truth. This series then explores what it means to create and revel in imagined and simulated worlds, uncanny characters, and magical actions at a time when the slippage between truth and fiction is muddling our modern lives. We continue this inquiry tonight with artist Samara Golden. Samara was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and received her MFA from Columbia University. She currently lives and works in Los Angeles. Her work was included in the 2014 Hammer Biennial, and her large-scale and ambitious installation titled The Meat Grinder's Iron Clothes was featured in the 2017 Whitney Biennial. Solo exhibitions of her work have been mounted at MoMA PS1, Yerba Buena Center for Arts in San Francisco, Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, Knight Gallery also in Los Angeles, and Canada Gallery in New York's Lower East Side. In 2015, a monograph of Samara's work was published by MoMA PS1, and her work has been written about in Art Forum, Art in America, The New York Times, New Yorker, and Moose, among other publications. I'm very honored to have Samara as part of our fiction series to present her lecture, Psychological Architecture. Her installations integrate highly detailed three-dimensional constructed spaces and two-dimensional reflections of those spaces seen through mirrors. The amalgamated effect of this dimensional interplay evokes the viewer to question if what you are seeing is really a structure there in front of you or merely an echoed image. The confusion of veracity occurs precisely in that reflection. Embracing optical illusion not as a malicious deception or gimmick, Samara employs it instead as a sophisticated device capable of manifesting internal ethereal emotions or ideas in external, literal, physical spaces. A convocation, exorcism, or psychic manifestation. Using the personal as momentum, but not as biography, these elaborate constructed spaces become material allegories for mental landscapes with layers of consciousness. Her environments often appear spatially stratified and conflicted reflecting our interior lives full of contradictions and dissonance, as well as the anxieties generated by our political and social climate rife with inequality. With her lecture this evening, we will consider the capacity for a fabricated, impossible space to expose the realities of literal, metaphysical, and sociopolitical structures. It is my pleasure to welcome Samara Golden. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, thank you Gretchen for the really nice introduction. Um, <clears throat> I'm happy to be here, thank you all for having me. Um, so I was trying to figure out where to start this because I have so many projects and I decided that I should start it around 2011, so this will be like the last six years. And then, um, or seven. Um, Right. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, um, sorry, I have a nervous attack like at the very beginning of a library talk. I'm sure you guys understand. Um, 
but uh, well, then we can go back if there's extra time and talk about earlier stuff or do it like that. So um, this um, is an installation that I did at the First Night Gallery, which is actually a gallery started by someone I went to grad school with in LA, and we had just moved to LA. And um, this is kind of a break from the work I was doing earlier, which I'll just quickly say it was like, uh, I used a lot of live video and color keying and was about kind of a maximal um, view on things, but I sort of was feeling at this point that I um, didn't know what my connection to all of it was. It was sort of like I intellectually was interested in the stuff I was dealing with, but I didn't know how it was exactly related to me. So a really wonderful gift happened, you know, where I got in a really severe breakup and I had to make this show and I had uh, no idea what to do and I really didn't want to do it. And do um, you think we could have turned on the lights a little bit, actually? I don't know if that's... Um, just so you guys look at that and not me. <laughs> but um, so... Anyway, this show was a turning point for my work because it ended up being sort of about um, creating an emotional pitch um, or like, uh, I talked about it at that time as the sixth dimension, which since I've stopped talking about it that way because I felt it was repeated too much and I didn't really know what I was talking about. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I sort of, um, well, I can explain that in a minute, but it had music um, and there's, it's, there's a camera trained on those two chairs, and this is just one room, and then there's another room. And um, the camera is color keying out that red blob and putting red waves into the, um, into the video monitors. So, um, oops, I forgot I have it on mute. Just a sec. going to go back and forth between muting it but um so I just needed to make the show really fast so I started using this material called Armax or Thermax just because I could really quickly make big objects and um, do it by myself and I didn't need anyone else's help because it's so light and I also already knew how to use it because my dad used to make domes out of it in the 70s and he showed me how to cut it and all that. Um, so I can play this song more in, the, in a second, but um, so yeah, this, is, this light is actually closer to kind of how it looked. Um, and then there's all these small details in it, like the, there's a ton of amplifiers, and that was because I was like sort of trying to, uh, the person who I split up with was like, made all this audio equipment from scratch and I was trying to understand just what he was thinking um, and by making some kind of things that he was making, sort of. So anyway, this, um, and this is kind of like a domestic space and that was supposed to be a jacuzzi. And I had felt um, really uh, like I didn't know how to make stuff. And then with this piece, I was so distraught that I just had to, make stuff anyway and it was kind of a good lesson to learn just to kind of move through and not be just I mean to me that's a jacuzzi and I don't know if that looks like that to anybody else <laughs> but and then that um, those are crashing a projection of crashing waves in the background and that's like it was important to me to um, I just took that footage um, and it was kind of crappy um, pixelated footage, but I took it at a certain moment when it was like, I don't mean to be all dramatic, I just want, like, want to tell you guys kind of the root of it, but when I was like all extremely upset and then when I was making the installation it was clear I should go reshoot it um, to make it look better, but I just totally refused to, so it was also part of me like realizing that I wanted to have the elements in the peace be sincere to me and that only I could only have it mean some to me this is what I figured out is I could only it could only mean something to someone else if it really deeply meant something to me and so 
<clears throat> that's pretty much why I'm just showing you these. And there was a, this is the other room. And then this is a projection behind the bed. And it's like every picture that I took from the last year, like flipping by like subconscious, um, or what do they call it? Subliminal messages. Um, and most of them were like of other projects I had made, because I just like to take pictures be behind the scenes or whatever, which you'll, you guys will see a lot in this talk. But, um, and then there were all these videos of me like making other projects, like frying this face, um, and then me crying, which is totally crazy that I would take video of me crying, and that's pathetic, but, um, and I wouldn't, <laughs> or like, for me, it, but, um, but the good thing about this too is I felt like, okay, so I have nothing left to lose, and it made me um, be, I guess, like I wasn't trying to present myself in a certain way, and I thought it's a good lesson to learn to be willing to be totally embarrassed, and I was scared for the show opening totally, and, but, so what ended up happening is that it was just this feeling, the show, and that was a big breakthrough. Um, and the music is just a song that I always loved, and I always wanted to be a musician, and all my friends were always musicians up until I went to grad school. Um, and um, so, and I had never really fully done it because I was scared. And then I just started making all the music for my own installations on this one. So um, that's just like another still. There's just all kinds of stuff, so. And um, all the furniture is made out of RMAX too. Oh, and the projection, what I was gonna say about it is, this is what I thought of as a migraine headache because I get migraines really badly. And um, there's like a visual element. I'm sure you guys have them too. <laughs> um, but it's called an aura and it like is a jaggedy arc in your eyes. And so I thought of this projection headboard thing as being like a migraine headache aura, which um, I've tried to do that in other ways too. So. Um, and then there was this broken mirror. Like, it's very, it's embarrassing always to look back at your old work. But, um, and also just like, this kind of color keying is super simple, and that, I thought that was also a good um, direction because I had been making more, more complex things with text and getting color keyed into sculptures and stuff. So anyway, I'll just blow through this. Um, and like, this is just a picture of the amplifiers. And uh, part of it was also this kind of, like I felt like this piece had a lot more um, weight in my studio. Um, and it had kind of like a supernatural or witchy kind of feeling about it. And so I just started recording myself in front of the projection. And then I tried to put these videos back into the piece but I don't think I was that successful with it, but you can kind of see, um, I think, maybe not, in the bedroom, no, I don't see them, of course, but there were like monitors and they would show those. Um, and the space was much darker than this, but it was important to me that it was powder blue and kind of looked hazy. Um, and so then, um, so this is an installation I made for the first Freeze Art Fair in, um, in New York. And I didn't have any idea what it, that I didn't, I had never even been to an art fair before. And I didn't know that people really didn't make installations for them because it's completely impossible logistically. And um, I made everything for this, which is like two stairways. There's a ribbon that goes through that has text that's being color keyed into it. There's a projection that actually has my shadow in it. And then there's subliminal messages um, to the viewer that are in that. And then there's all these other little things. And like the whole thing is wearing a necklace and, I'll sh and there's these masks and I'll show you all those details. But just to back up, the curator wanted me to make um, a piece about Randall's Island and I don't really work like that. And um, so I tried reading all these books. Randall's Island is in New York and that's where the fair is. Um, I, I read all these books about what the island was and it's really sad. It was like a pauper's grave, um, like a grave for people who didn't have family. And it, there's an insane asylum there and all these stories happened. And then I just, I didn't really know um, 
<clears throat> what this is a picture of it in London later though, so I'm gonna go back to that. But um, I didn't really know what to do with all those stories. So then I tried like meditating and trying to figure out what's my connection to all this stuff. And I saw this woman in a yellow dress whose name was Anne, and she was like one of the nurses at the insane asylum. And I, so I had that, and then I was gonna make, I'll try to make a piece about that. And then I just felt like this is, um, not me. And so um, I just ended up feeling like, okay, the thing with all the books is there's just this incredible sadness at this place. And then I thought what I need to do is just try to add the sadness, make the piece about my sadness so it's more connected to me and more sincere, I guess. So over a really long story, which I won't tell you all of, like it ended up being about suicide. Um, and these masks or paintings or faces just ended up being like a convocation of a whole bunch of different people. Because I found out at that time, this is like 2012, um, that, you know, just like the how many people commit suicide every second. There's, I can't remember the statistics, but it's insane. And uh, I had someone when I was like uh, 14, my first boyfriend. <laughs> who committed suicide, and so I hadn't really ever dealt with that in terms of artwork. And, um, but also at the same time, just to like pre present this idea and we'll talk about it more, I didn't want the piece to be about me. I don't think it's important that you know any of that story. I just wanted to make a place where these like souls or something could be and that could hold them, but that also could power the message back to the people. So like a good message. So the way it worked is that, um, so this is just in a booth at a fair and you know that's really um, anticlimactic. And, um, but the good thing is that like, I felt like teenagers and stuff would come and spend a huge amount of time there. And there was, which was really flattering to me because I've known teenagers are really picky. Um, <laughs> But the subliminal messages that are in the water reflections are um, just like statements like, um, they're kind of like positive affirmations, but they're pretty specific. They're just kind of like, someone does love you and like you are important or you are beautiful. And I don't know, it's, it's cheesy. But they felt that they were true and I just wanted people not to be able, like the Pepsi ads and the 80s with the skulls and the ice cubes. I wanted people not to realize that they were seeing anything, but to get the message. So it's kind of a bit of a test too on other people. But, um, and so then there's this ribbon that's black and um, there's a camera trained on the whole piece kind of framing it. And I decided that frame was actually what the piece was to me. Um, so I thought, it, of it as being the image mediated in the, I don't like that word, but in the monitor is what I really thought the piece was. And everything else was kind of like in service to that one ish image. And I thought of that image as like a painting or whatever. And um, so there's text that's scrolling through the black ribbon that you can only see in the video because it's coming in through like just an analog mixer. And um, this was like really hard for me to figure out too because I'm not really good at this kind of stuff. So it was a text from all these ans insanities, um, like tests that you could take online um, to see if you're insane. And some of them were, I mean, that sounds really too clear, but some of them were um, jokes almost, like it wasn't really clear if it was true that this was a real test. And some of them were like, psychological tests and stuff. And so I just kind of, like I created a text file that had a lot of parts of that and then also a lot of just stuff from my own writing and um, everything. And so it just scrolled through there and you'd have to stand there for like two hours or something to be able to read all of it. And it was sort of hidden too and nobody seemed to even see that. <laughs> but, um, so, and then, um, oh, and also, so that's the, that's kind of a confusing image in the 
monitor right there, but there are also these monsters that um, I, vi I videotape myself with these masks on coming out from under something, and then I color keyed it in so that it looked like there was these like ghosts or monsters or something coming out from under the stairway, just on the monitor. So again, I was like trying to just build up some kind of um, other dimension um, within what's happening in the piece. And just to go back to that idea about the sixth dimension, at this time I was describing it as kind of like the pieces as being like this conduit for, um, I don't know, like place that is multiple places all at once um, happening at the same time. So it could be like a forest in the 1800s and, and that same place could also be the top of a mountain and it could also um, like a desert mountain, and it could also be, um, uh, I can't think of any of my examples, um, you know, I can't think of what any of them are, but uh, a swimming pool at the top of a skyscraper or something. So I was really trying to, I don't think I was successful, but I was really trying to think about how one piece could be in multiple spaces and time all at once because I'm really interested in that intellectually, I guess, or spiritually, but I don't like that word either. Um, but anyway, the, all those um, rocks and stuff are all faked and they're just made out of that foam with the um, uh, like backing ripped off and also just at this point like I make everything myself pretty much and it's really important to me to really um, like I discover a lot about what the piece is going to be by actually making it which I always forget even now today like I'm always trying to make an idea that will be a whole idea and present it and then make it and it's like totally not the way I work <laughs> so um, anyway we'll just uh, blow through these um, um, and those are the masks and then I think I have a bunch this is like this the rock wall I made that's kind of like this supposed to be like a wet um, graveyard wall or something <laughs> and then all these masks which I had a really a lot of fun doing it because I have a hard time giving myself an excuse to paint um, <laughs> but I really like painting so I think I just have a million pictures of the masks um, here, so I'll just go quick through them. But I liked how they came, they sort of became their own people to me. And there's some other really huge, um, like four by eight faces too that were in it, but I don't have pictures. And then I'm gonna blow through like so many things here to try to get to another project. But I can go back to this um, and uh, this is like not really art, this is just in my studio. But um, this is like my attempt at making like a wall work, which, um, and this one too. Um, but I'm not going to talk about these just because they're sort of like a thing I'm always trying to figure out and I think it's another story. Um, so this piece uh, was at MOCA in Los Angeles, and um, I just got a very small amount of time to build it. And so pretty much what it is is taking some of the ideas in the other piece and then turning them back on themselves. So this piece was pretty much about anxiety and uh, insomnia, because I, I have them both. And, um, so it's supposed to be, there's a vase with a projection on it, then there's this um, analog 3D projection behind that also has a shadow of me that gets up and walks away. And then you put on these um, thrift store sunglasses that I put um, two different colored gels in, just like the really analog 3D. And then when you look at it, the it was supposed to work where the migraine projection is what I was still calling it here, um, which is like, f you know, 50 million pictures from that year, um, kind of like appears as a whole when you're wearing the glasses. And so um, I guess actually there's sound on this and I forgot to put it up. 
Oh, maybe it's not cute on this one. So uh, that was also a song I always really loved and it's really sad and it's pretty much about um, a person who's like, I guess it's about the pressure of being watched. They're a tightrope walker and then it's like everyone's waiting for them to fall and wanting them to fall kind of and then the idea of, you know, because being an artist is stressful. <laughs> so it's kind of like about the idea or can be. Um, about the idea of like just unrolling that amount of anxiety into a piece um, and just feeling it instead of pretending it's not there. And then this on the vase is my, is, I know this seems like it's like, it's me, it's me, which I find disgusting, but I don't really know. I wasn't like able to use other people just because I didn't know what I was doing and I was the one there. <laughs> So, um, and this person on the vase is singing that song. Um, and then there's like potato chips made out of clay and a hand with a hamburger. And there's um, these um, pieces of fabric are actually dipped in glue and then stapled really high up. So it's kind of like a um, fake marble of, well, the, usually you see carved marble trying to be fabric, and so this is like fabric trying to be um, marble, and it's hard. And then there was a mirror. Um, sorry, I'm just describing everything right now, but I think it's kind of hard to tell, and it's going to get really hard to tell what's going on. But um, there's a mirror on the bed that's in front of this chair, and that mirror, um, uh, there's a little bit of the hamburger. Um, oh yeah, and I also, this face is supposed to, I'm supposed to kind of look like a monster in it. And just very quickly, the vase, the idea of the vase originally was that my own ashes when I die were gonna go in the vase. And then I thought that, that eventually that was just like too gory and not really that important. And I didn't know for sure if I wanted to stand in those shoes, because there are, I mean, there's all different kinds of artists, but there's like um, artists who like buy the grave plot for themselves to go next to somebody else and stuff. And I think I just felt like it wasn't really about that. So um, yeah, and the fireplace was supposed to burn all the bad thoughts that I ever had in the middle of the night. But instead of those things, I ended up putting all the words, um, yeah, so this is like a close-up of the images, or maybe one. I ended up making the words for all my anxieties, um, scrolling on the ceiling, and then the only way you can read them is to look into the mirror on the bed. And so you have to get pretty close up to it. And actually, someone tripped and fell on the mirror and broke the mirror. And I'm just like so lucky that I didn't get sued or something. Um, but I did learn that like, you know, it's tough with um, people will fall all over everything <laughs> um, when they're trying to read something. So, um, but yeah, so this was like a very long script or uh, whatever you want to call it, text. There was like all lots of emails that went into the communication of making this piece. Um, lots of uh, just me jotting down everything so that I could try to get it out of my head so that I could go to sleep. And I didn't know what I was doing. Like I collected this over a bunch of years of old stuff. Um, and uh, yeah. And then these are the potato chips made at clay. Just to show you that I like to make stuff. <laughs> um, and I think I don't have too many back. So, okay. So this is, um, I think I'm going too slow though. But, um, this is 
night gallery moved to a big gallery and decided they wanted to become more of a commercial thing. And I was terrified because it's like it was a 6,000 foot, square foot space. And like I said, I make everything really detailed usually. And um, I just didn't know how I was going to hold that space and make it be powerful. Um, so what I decided to do in the end was to um, think of it as like expanding the space. Um, instead of trying to control it. So this is the first, this is like, I, I uh, made it so that you had to walk through a, another gallery and then you came out right here and there was nowhere else you could enter it from. So this is like the first thing you see and it's an L-shaped wall that has mirrors on it and then this blue living room type thing. And um, I thought of it like, just like as a side note, I'm always thinking of the perspectives in my work as kind of like constructing an image or like a photo or a painting or something. So, um, and I can talk about all the details in here forever, but um, just really loosely and we can come back to this. I ended up thinking about this room because there's several rooms that you walk around through um, being like an existential thought or being um, like a wide open, feeling and that it had uh, all the details are from actually I had two grandparents or one grandfather two grandmothers one grandmother was this is the remarried grandmother <laughs> um, and she would like had good taste and she was like I mean good taste you know and she was fancy and had more money and had lived in New York and they lived in Arizona in this house that was like had all these tiny details like guitars with abalone inlays and um, I think I have close-ups and little boxes and they had a lamp like that and stuff and it was a really amazing experience to go to their house because they had white carpet and they had cocktail hour and it was just like weird but also not my life and then um, I'll talk about my other grandma and my normal life in a minute <laughs> but um, so in while doing this, though, I really ended up feeling like what the image was in the mirror was actually what the piece was about, sort of like in the same way that the, um, the piece that was for Freeze, which I forgot to tell you, that was called Bad Brains, the one with the ribbon, black ribbon going through. So um, that piece ended up being that what you saw in the monitor was actually what I considered the piece. But the, for this one, I realized that I think what I see in the mirrors is, a, is actually the piece. And this was to me like an alternate reality or kind of like a crystal. Um, I don't want to talk about it in drug terms exactly, but it's sort of like sometime, if sometimes you're in a different space in your mind and you can see things, in a really different way and there's more clarity kind of or some kind of beauty that you can't really experience in real life. So in this one I um, thought of everything in that room as being in service to the images in the mirror. So that's what I learned from that side of it. And then there are all kinds of details like this is a brain hat, like a hat with a brain I'm crawling out of it or blowing out of it. Um, and. Those couches, there's a long story, it has to do with my dad, but I'll keep on going, come back. But, and then there, these keyboards, um, I, I like sat up at night a bunch of nights in a row and just played keyboards alone in my um, room or apartment or whatever, and then made that into a soundtrack, and then this little part had its own soundtrack. And then this room overall had this really intense, um, I unfortunately didn't put on the slide, but kind of like um, the beginning of Apocalypse Now, or it was like a sort of like war music, like with the helicopters. And I really love films and watch tons of them and kind of like always think about my installations in terms of cinematic um, kind of like taking you with it in an emotional way, the way a film does. And music definitely helps with that. So it was like really loud in here, like crazy, crazy loud. Um, and sorry, I don't have that. Oh, I do have this sound though for these, which is super unimpressive. But um, let's see. It was 
just supposed to be a kind of lonely stuff. Um, by a non-keyboard player. Um, so, um, oh yeah, and then I was gonna talk about the abalone really quickly, is just, um, I'm always like trying to figure out an approximation of stuff, because it's just a really fun challenge. So this is like, painted Armax and then has cellophane on it and glue and Gorilla Glue and all these mixtures of goopy stuff and then I made like whole sheets of this and then I would cut it up into squares and then put them back together like little tiles and kind of like, um, I can't think of the word, but inlay them like that and it was really great because they really ended up looking like abalone and so that was fun. <laughs> um, and yeah, like the guitar. There's a everything has a huge story though, so it's all very, very personal to me. Um, but mostly it's because I just believed in it could only have meaning to someone else if I if I feel something about it. So then you go around the back of that room and you enter this room, um, which is sort of like related to my other grandma who um, used to live with us in Michigan. Um, in the, I guess, early 80s, the late 70s. And um, she was awesome. She was like incredibly intelligent and a librarian. And she smoked, chain smoked constantly and drank like so much, like a fifth of liquor a night. And uh, watched black and white TV and lived kind of like in our laundry room. Um, <laughs> if, but I grew up in a fake. Frank Lloyd Wright house in Michigan though, which is like really bad because the had a flat roof and the snow would um, pile up and then it would just leak all over the place and it had plexiglass windows. And this guy that um, he like built it around his family one room at a time and stuff. And I loved that house. But anyway, so I have really amazing good memories of her, but she died when I was like seven, I think. So this room was sort of about, um, you know, I really sometimes hate the process of naming everything, but what I was trying to do here with these animals and this wallpaper was make them um, go in and out of the wallpaper, sort of in a hallucinogenic kind of way, um, which I'm just gonna, like, that's more of a close-up of them. But I just sewed them and then painted faces on them. And um, the, I don't know, I was just trying to, uh, do things differently, I guess. So, um, but just quickly back to this. There was a, I guess like a certain amount of tension in this, in this side too, because there's like dinner for two, but I didn't really want it to be narrative, but there's knives and stuff. And um, I was thinking it's related to, this is related to some pieces that I blew past earlier, but, um, I get, so I get really bad migraines and for a long time I've been trying to have different diets all the time to try to figure out what would make me feel better. And so uh, then I got really into, you know, not eating meat and really into learning about um, all the horrible things we do to animals. And so those pieces that I blew by, like those eyes and um, the food pieces, they were a lot about that. Um, and then these animals were kind of an extension of that for me. Um, so, but just in general too, I wanted to explain that in this piece, so you enter, you see this car um, that's a real car like hidden kind of like into where the regular entrance would be, um, which I'll show you in a minute. And then you had to come around this gallery and then enter into the blue room and then you enter in this red room. And then I just meant for you to walk around all of it. And I thought of each room as a thought and like it was a big brain and that you just were walking through the thoughts. Just telling you that because later I do something else with that. Oh, and then this is a, um, a sunset, the same deal as the, um, as the waves that were crashing over the other piece, which was called, that piece was called Rape of the Mirror. And I forgot to say that, I think. But so in this video, again, terrible quality, but this crazy thing happened where, I don't think I have a picture of it, but um, this little guy just came out of nowhere when I was video, 
um, when I was taking the video, and he had a guitar on his back, and he just like walked into the frame and then just stayed at one, at like three quarters through the frame. And then he took out his um, guitar and started playing to the ocean. And I just thought it was too insane, like too funny, because it looks like I planned it and it's like a, you know, like a, it looks like one of those films. Um, and so anyway, I put that on one side and then it was reflected in the blue room. Um, and then this is the car, and I don't concentrate on this because I was trying to actually have it be an entire parking lot full of wrecked cars that you had to walk through to get into the installation, but I could only get one. <laughs> and it ended up being this red um, BMW, which is like totally um, so about Los Angeles, like it's like less than zero, um, all these different films are like all about this particular time and I didn't actually think it felt right with my installation. But so then I put these legs in there and I made a mess inside of it and stuff. But anyway, um, and then the last element of the piece was when you came out of the red room, you'd walk around and you see this um, stage that was also built out of our Max. So everything's super fragile and you can't sit on anything or touch anything. And then these, um, I made these railings with PVC um, tubing or piping or whatever, and spray painted it gold. Like it's all really pretty jinky. Um, but and then what there was is a purple light that went back and forth, which the um, purple light was attached to a fan and just hanging from the ceiling, and it kept on breaking. But um, I thought of this being the final thought was just like a performance of a purple flame or something, or a purple, like the, the light was the performer, it just kept on going back and forth. But for some reason it doesn't look purple in here, so sorry, it's much more purple. Um, so I'm going to go by this piece, but this was um, at the hammer, oh gosh, sorry, I touched the mic, <laughs> um, at the hammer biennial. and. Um, uh, it was using the 3D glasses again, and um, so hard not to talk about it. Let's listen to the music. So um, just briefly, I had the 3D glasses again, and I took pictures of everyone I knew. The idea was it was supposed to be a sculpture made up of everyone who ever saw the sculpture. And this was like my recipe for trying to make a new kind of work when I first got to Los Angeles. So the first iteration of the show was at this tiny place called Workspace. And I have pictures of it um, if we want to go back. But that show was like these sculptures of all the people I had f met when I first moved there. And then I took pictures of everyone that came to that show and saw that piece and then printed them um, just like with the red and green separated in Photoshop so that when you wore the glasses and walked around the sculpture, it looked like totally terrifying and creepy and everyone looked like a weird, un I guess they call it uncanny, but they looked like a horrible version of themselves. Um, but also, it was called Thank You, which is weird that I did that, but um, it was sort of like about the idea of that we can't do this without each other, but it was also like very critical of everything, and everyone who was in it was kind of not sure about it. And I actually kind of hate the piece, that's why I didn't want to talk about it, but now I'm talking about it. But. Um, <laughs> And the, but one thing to know is like there's curators and stuff, and the person who put me in the show is one of the people because they went to the other, the first iteration of the show. So it was just an interesting. It was supposed to be a lifelong project, and that like now, this iteration of it kind of screwed it up though because there's no way that I could, I couldn't have taken pictures of everyone who came to the Hammer Museum show, um, which it was like for a biennial, so there was a lot of people. So anyway, um, oh yeah, and so there was also this element which was that you, there's a camera looking at the sculpture and then you um, 
in order to kind of see the monitor, you have to stand in there and look over the um, faces, and then your own face gets put into the faces, which is so cheesy, but it was pretty fun to do, and I think I don't have, I don't know if I have a picture of someone's face in there, but it's a really different way for me to work. Um, so, and then, okay, so this is my show at PS1 in New York, and um, again, like I had a really small amount of time to make it, like probably three months or something, and um, this is the first piece that I made a model of what it would be like so that I could figure out the reflections. So um, I'll show that to you later. But there's, so what you're looking at, because I know it's confusing, is that there's a mirrored floor. And um, there, I forgot I can walk. Well, I don't know. There's a, <laughs> uh, there's, the mirror is like kind of cutting the bottom stairway in half. You can tell where there's like a V. And so you're looking down from a second floor balcony. And by the way, tell me if I'm explaining everything too much because I don't want to be condescending about it. I just don't know if you can see what it is. But you're looking down from a second floor balcony and um, that white room that you see at the bottom is actually what is really in real life on the ceiling. And like that surgical bed you see down there is under this peach bed. I think you can see it. Also, there's music, so I'll just. More, but it's the song is about like um, bless the executioner because he doesn't know uh, his soul. That's really great. I forgot the lyrics. Basically, just that even the executioner has a bad life because they have to deal with the fact that they are that person. Um, so Let's see where to start. So there's wheelchairs um, that look like they're falling down stairways in the reflection. Um, so it's supposed to be kind of this, to me, um, this like layers of consciousness piled up on top of each other. And I only got to this idea because through the process of making the model. Um, 20 more, oh no, okay. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to blow through a lot of stuff here, but, um, okay. <laughs> I, um, so, okay, the thing that I can tell you about it that I don't need other people to know, but is the truth is that I almost died of pneumonia in the hospital when I was 30, and um, I had this really weird experience in the hospital, never had made art about it at all, and so or really talked about it much even, or even really remembered it that much. So this, what I'm calling the surgical bed, is kind of like a manifestation of this place in between life and death that I thought I was. So the way I see it is that this peach bed, I guess I can show you more pictures. Oh, here, I'll just expl I'll tell you about the way I thought of it, and then we'll look at details. But the peach bed I thought of is like our everyday life, you know, like what we wake up into, and is the just every day. And then the, the surgical bed is like sort of this decision or choice or um, place in between life or death or um, suspension. And the reason I say that is because when, um, when I was really sick, someone came in to teach me how to swallow. And they actually said, and they were, they were a nurse, they, said like you have a choice now you could either choose to live and it'd be really hard and you have to fight really hard and you have to make the decision with all of your body and your I, they didn't say soul but like you know you have to completely commit to it or you could just decide to let go and like no one had no one really talked to me you know about what was going on and it was really interesting i thought later that um this person did that because i think it's against the law um or like it's not ethically maybe tr concrete, but I really heard the person and then I just like tried to 
pull myself out of this weird world I was in. And I like I had been hallucinating and um, I forgot to say that the animal, <laughs> I'm always forgetting stuff. The animals that were in the red room in the last, in the mass murder installation, which I forgot to tell you the name of that too, <laughs> with a big one with you, when you, with, that was a brain. Um, those animals were based off the hallucination of animals jumping up on my bed and um, like, um, I like was surrounded by animals at one point in the hospital room, which sounds really weird, but um, that's what I remember. Um, so anyway, then this white room that ends up being at the very bottom, um, which you see, sorry. Um, uh, let's see if we can get a shot of that. This white room to me ended up being this idea of like vacation or heaven or release or meditation or just relaxing or um, our like vision of what those things are like maybe this is like a beach house um, with big windows that go out to the ocean and wind in it and there's space and um, but through doing this installation I realized what I was I, I really loved it that my kind of like idea of the stratification of consciousness could come through in this physical form for me as being levels all like in alignment with each other. But also I loved that the white room kind of made this um, impossible space that we can never experience in real life. So it's like, uh, um, it's kind of like, well, when you make artwork or just stuff, you have a thought and then you have to bring it down into the world through materials. And then I love the way in my own mind that this room pushed it back up into a thought kind of, because no one could ever go sit on that bed. It's not a reality, even though it's physically there, it's impossible. So I really learned that through this. Um, and then there is like an insane amount of details here. And um, sorry, um, I think I'm gonna, well, I mean, I have a ton of um, behind the scenes photos. I can show you how everything's made and stuff. But um, like, those are all guitars. I'll just show you. Um, and there was a projection of the ocean crashing waves and stuff. And this is all life size. Um, and uh, like these plants, these spider plants and books and stuff are actually on the underside of this venting tube thing that I had to cover so it kind of looked like it all fit. And there's like ice in the glass over there and like there's, this is a spilled glass of wine uh, that I made on the floor and then I just like attached it to the table and stuff and a hand painted rug and um, those fans are like, it's just really, really detailed, which is crazy. Um, and these IVs and stuff, like all the stuff that's on this level is upside down in real life. Um, and uh, let's see, that really briefly, that thing that looks like a moon because of the way it looks in the reflection, was actually my attempt at trying to really make those animals that I saw, which um, appeared to me like static energy, kind of like a migraine halo um, or aura, like moving static energy. So what I did is I made these animals. I think I have a close up. Sorry. Uh oh, music cues. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. So. Um, there is multicolored fabric, and then I had flashing lights, um, or f I made a Photoshop or a movie that just had like red, green, like all the colors in there going over the whole thing, and it flashed really fast. And so what happened is it made it look like they were electric and moving all around, which I really loved as a sculpture idea. But the thing is, when I put that into the piece, it just didn't really work with the overall feeling of the piece. It sort of took away from the um, just this bigger experience and so I just put it in there and it ended up being a moon. I like made it into the shape. So I just said that because it's like a lot of things I make don't work out being like really being what I thought they were going to be. Um, and then there was also a live feed um, 
of a camera looking at the bed through the reflection and then um, it was on this little um, lower, like you were on the second floor looking down before and now you're on the lower level and there's this little tiny space um, which is like a basement um, floor I thought and I got this crappy couch and made some more animals and stuff and it was supposed to be like this warm space and the other space was more this cool space. Um, but the live feed plays, um, actually I think I might have a video of it in here. Um, so that's the view and then color keyed into the black spaces. Oops, yeah, this is it. Our, um, all these words, which is again like, you wouldn't see the beginning of it though, you just see these kind of like really hidden inside of it. And this is just like all the things, all the lists that had to go into making the piece and all my negotiations with the curators and all my worries about everything and all my grief <laughs> and uh, good things too. And it was just like all supposed to be this heavy thing behind. Um, but I didn't feel it was that important in the end. This was like more important um, for me. So that was good to learn. Um, and then I think, sorry, there's a lot of music cues. I'm just trying to get through them. Um, I'm just going to show you the behind the scenes pictures. Um, okay, yeah, sorry. This is like looking down from the railing upstairs into the piece and that's the little basement area. Um, oops. And then this is me in the back area behind my studio that's not mine, <laughs> trying to get away with um, just resining all of the guitars and stuff that I made and cellos because I didn't want to do it in my studio. Um, and this is making the instruments and just my really messy studio. Um, and like all the fun, it's kind of fun because like you get to understand how things are built in real life when you try to make them as um, as parts of other installations. But I also, a lot of people accused or always had actually or said that they thought that all these things in my installations were like props and I, even though Earlier I said that everything was in service to the mirror. I also really feel like they're not props for a play that's happening. They're sort of like, I believe in the fact that I'm like putting energy into making them and that they have kind of like a, kind of like how you can tell that one um, vase is, like if you have two vases that look exactly the same and one is made by a person who really cared about it and then they, and then someone took that vase and brought it to a factory and had the factory make it, even if it looks exactly the same, I feel like um, that you could, I mean, it's kind of like superstitious, which I'm super superstitious, but um, you could tell which is which or one would be better than the other. So this is the model that I made to figure it out and I just kept on ripping it apart and redoing it and stuff and I was trying to figure out a crazy amount of logistics um, and so this was really challenging. And these are just after those guys got resin. Um, and this is, I went to Michigan, so the way it was going to work out is I was going to be able to go to PS1 and work in the print shop which is like their little studio area. Um, for a couple weeks to make the rest of the stuff because they didn't want to ship it all the way from LA. And so basically I cut up every part of everything in LA and then I put it all together at PS1, except for I went to Michigan first and made these stairways, which is where my parents live um, and where I grew up and um, <coughs> made the stairways and just made, this is me making sure that they actually work and fit together. That was like a crazy project because they're life size, you know. Um, and then I just think this is a funny picture. That was like the cellos being shipped. Um, and there's lampshades. And then I made all this different stuff in the print shop. But actually, the doorways were tiny. And there were like three teeny little rooms. And so it was like a basically you had to make things in parts and then bring them outside. <laughs> Epoxy them like right before the show went up. But the whole thing was crazy. Um, and so this is the medical wall um, that's behind the surgical uh, bed. 
and lamps and the bed, you know, like it had, this one had to hang upside down, so it's like glued and then resined. Um, and this is me making the painting for the rug like the night before the install started. And actually, like something weird that happened during this is that when I arrived in LA, um, or I mean, sorry, in New York, you know, I've been, I sort of was like really depending on the crew there to help me figure out how to hang everything. And I mean, I was like way beyond my comfort zone, as they say, for like my vision of it was like nothing I knew how to do. Um, but I got there and one of their um, close members of their staff had just commit suicide. And so it was like totally weird feeling everywhere. And I first was like thinking like, how can I make this work? Like, how can I do this alone? Like, and then I just started feeling like, okay, this is a moment where you just take in what life really is and then try to figure out what the piece is in relation to that, which I know sounds vague, but anyway, it ended up being just some, I don't know what to say about it, but. So this is like making the, spilling the wine on the floor and then waiting for it to um, cure. And um, this is just like the process of putting it together, which was crazy because like no one knew how to do it. So we just built all these weird jigs that went on to these dollies. Um, uh, like, and ladder, like it just, everyone was had to be hanging on a limb. And I was really thankful for all of it. And actually, Mike Kelly had had a show there um, a few months before, and he left all these um, little, uh, this is a technical thing, but they're like, you, you pull the wire and then it tightens, and that's how you can like um, pull something up into a space and then have it stay. So we got to use all these things that he left, and they were like really expensive Japanese little, um, things, I still don't know the name of them, but, um, but that was like really lucky because it was really hard to do anyway. Okay, I better go faster. Um, and this is the main guy who helped, who was like the head of the crew there, and this is me trying to explain my weird stairway to him. Um, and I think, yeah, and nothing fit in anything because it's an old building, so. Um, and this is putting down the mirror floor. Oh yeah, and I just wanted to show that because that's someone having fun. <laughs> like, just being like, having a good time, which is cool. Um, and then I'm not gonna talk about this one, but this was at Freeze. Um, it was part of like the curated art projects part, and this is under the tent um, in this like basement area. But we can go back to that because I wanna try to get Oh my gosh, oh damn, it's so hard to, okay, this was, that piece is based off of this Arakab, um drawing that I always loved ever since I was a kid, and um, I just love, this is called Thanksgiving, and this is, you can see what it is, and I just wanted to kind of like make a space under the fair that was like showing the true qualities of the capitalist fair, it was kind of against the fair. <laughs> um, and then these are the figures in it, or in my studio, and they, I'm not supposed to know it. They had glow-in-the-dark skulls on the back of them, so you could see that. Um, I can come back to this. Um, are we at like the one-hour moment? Okay. <laughs> so this is my show at Canada Gallery in New York, and they had just got a brand new space. And uh, it was like a big white box. And uh, so I, again, was like, well, this is not good, you know, because I really like, um, I like to try to react off of the architecture. So again, I tried to make a model of it and then figure out what it could be. And so it, what it ended up being is um, it's a box. The room is a box, four walls, a square. And I built a stairway that went up and then a walkway that went diagonally through the space. And so the idea was when you're on the walkway in the middle, you're looking down at four different aerial views of rooms. Um, let's see if I can 
So like if you were to block out the left hand side, that's one aerial view of um, a like reception hall or a wedding or something like that. Um, and then to the left of it um, is this country restaurant with these stained glass windows that I made with lighting gels and um, that's the ceiling up there in real life, but the plants go this way, like a, sorry, like across the ceiling. So everything's weird with the gravity. This is a, um, like a buffet, and I've made all the food in it and stuff, which is fun. And then there's an apartment where like a single bed turns into a double bed, and um, and um, and then there's this lobby. So the idea of the piece was like this. Um, idea that when it was kind of about having too many choices so I thought of the piece kind of like a brain or a mind again or that it was like you were inside the skull of somebody and that they had four different choices to make but that they couldn't see um, more than one at one time so they're surrounded by this chaos of knowing that there are other choices behind them but you can't look in two different directions at once and kind of like yeah, something I haven't really talked about is kind of my, I've always wanted to make stuff that was like as complicated as living actually is or thinking. And I feel like I never ever get anywhere close to it. But kind of like making these structures or frameworks helps me like have a way to start or a way to feel. It's like a stretcher for a painting. You know what you're gonna, you know where you're gonna do it. So that's how I saw this piece. And there was also music. Um. Oh, I'll just go back to the other music, sorry. Oh, maybe it's all the way in the beginning. One thing that was cool is one of the art handlers or like people who is helping is a really good musician and uh, he's just like, like I love New York and it's always fun to go back and um, I went to his show the first night that I got there and it was just like this improvised show, this band growing and, um, and I recorded it and then I just like worked by pretty much by myself to make it into something totally different, which I thought of the, as being this dolphin song, and there's supposed to be this dolphin in this piece. <laughs> I totally ran out of time, and you'll see why. So it was really fun, though, because I kind of collaborated with him a bit. Like, he let me do it, eh? And then, um, I, you know, he listened to it and stuff. And then um, these guys from that other installation were sort of part of this. Um, and this is the model that I made for it. So this is the stairway going up, and that's the um, walkway it went across and in the original model it was going to be an orchestra um, that's like shaped like that C but then I made all the chairs and stuff and I just didn't think that it um, that it was working like that or didn't want to do it that's a model of the chair and then that's the real chair um, and then there are tons of these chairs which are like oops sorry grandmother chairs kind of or I don't know like Spindley, Michigan chairs. And um, this is all the parts that I um, cut, um, and then that's how I shipped everything. And um, so there's just like nuts amount of planning, and there's just me, although I, I, this is the first time I hired someone to help me cut um, things with just, we did it with knives. Um, and then this is like the first test I did in the space, which actually was a good lesson, because I ended up liking this test maybe better than the show. <laughs> but it was like just really different and more sparse. And so those are the chairs when I first put them together and that's another kind of chair. And um, these are yet another one that I made up when I was there and was like, it was crazy. I was like up all night every night for like a month in the summer in August in Chinatown. It was gross. <laughs> and then, um, 
I couldn't resin at the gallery anything because it's really toxic. So um, we brought everything in a truck to upstate New York, and this guy and his brother and wife, I think, um, resined it all, which was also the first time I had other people do stuff. But they, it was really hot, and there was there ended up being bugs and all the resin because <laughs> they did it in a barn. But I mean, I think it's funny. Um, but I don't know. And so I like had never done these windows before or anything, just was making this up. And then those two people are the owners of the gallery. There's four owners, but they were help, they were helping to install it <laughs> because. Yeah, it's just like that, because um, we didn't have anyone. And then, let's see. Okay, I'm going to be brief with this one. This is Yerba Buena, and um, it's a 2,000 square foot room, and it's in San Francisco. And it had these 18 ceiling vaults, um, which I guess like you're seeing a reflection of them in the mirror that I set up kind of like a ice skating rink. Um, but my idea for the piece when I first saw the room is, um, maybe, I don't know. When I first saw the room was that each one of these um, little individual ceiling vestibules or something would be its own room and would be, like, have a computer in it and, um, and would have no entrance or exit and that it'd be like kind of this apocalyptic sort of like view of the future where everyone's just emailing all the time and they think they have friends but they never see anyone because they're sort of in their own prisons. So the rooms that I made, I'm just gonna blow through to describing this sort of backwards, but these are the cold rooms which are what the, what the original thought was and I made six of them and they had um, like cool light bulbs, so blue, and like this stuff's all hanging upside down inside of this ceiling vault, and that's real daylight coming in. But then I decided, um, you know, this was all just like in my head that this was all going to happen because the install is only for like a week or something. Um, but then I decided that um, I also wanted there to be six stained glass rooms and six like frilly rooms with desserts in them, just because I I'm not really I don't want to make like a one statement, I wanted there to be messiness in it. So um, these frilly rooms have a different feeling. They're very warm colored, um, even more than this. Um, and then, let's see, which way are the, sorry, stained glass rooms. Um, yeah, and then these rooms were supposed to be total mess, but I found that it's really hard to make a mess upside down, and so I like had, I have behind the scenes pictures of this, but the, um, like all the fabric and everything is just always like glued and then made on the real floor and then stiffened and then you put it up on the ceiling and it was just impossible to make it look messy enough. Um, but um, I'm trying to think of those other things. So this is the original idea I had for that project, though I wanted to be more moody like this and to have like, well, there are a couple different originals. <laughs> You'll see I'm more complicated. <laughs> but, um, but then I realized that the daylight in, that, in those ceiling vaults was really more interesting. So I made these stained glass windows and this is um, just lighting gels again in black caulk. And I was really satisfied with kind of like the that like the easy or maybe faster way of doing this and how beautiful it is and so there all there was um, okay. uh, 12 panels I guess of that and then these lampshades and this is everything outside my studio right before I got it um, right before the truck came to pick it up um, and I just put that in because I don't have enough room in my studio to have everything out at the same time. And then these are like the curtains being stiffened and that's what they're like after, just so you can get a sense of gravity. Um, and there was a cat, tons of details. Um, and those are close, I don't know, you get the idea. Um, but 
I should probably talk about the Whitney piece. Okay, here. <laughs> so this is uh, was at the Whitney Biennial uh, last year, I guess, or a year and a half ago. Um, and so I made another model for this piece, which I'll show you, but um, this is the entrance, and I wanted to make sure that there's a wheelchair um, ramp um, up to it for a couple reasons, which I, I'll talk about later maybe. But um, so I worked with them to design this beginning and then you walk up and onto a platform. And then, um, so this is looking down into the mirrors and up above there on the very top is what you see actually through the window of the real museum. And then that's a little half size railing along the back. And then everything below that black line is a reflection. And I had mirrors on the floor and on the ceiling, so it made an infinity. Um, like, it just goes on endlessly down and endlessly up. So, um, and maybe I'll come back to this picture, but you can see that there's different levels that repeat. There's four on each side. Um, wait, there's eight. I, get, I can get confused myself. Um, and then this is looking up. Um, up into the ceiling mirrors. Um, so actually, maybe I will skip ahead to the structure of it, and then we can go back. Um, so it's hard to figure out what the best way to um, explain it, because it's hard to understand. But so basically, there was four levels that I created. One is the actual floor, and everything is half size just because of the the ceiling to the, or the floor to the real ceiling in the space was 16 feet. So in order for the scale to be right, so it was like um, this bottom wheelchair area was one floor, then there's another floor under this middle platform, and both of them had to have enough headspace for a person to, like a small person in this world, so that it didn't hit the other one in the reflection. So um, yeah, there's one, two, three, and then there's a ceiling level, and that's on both sides. Um, and so, yeah, you can see that's the mirror better in this picture. Um, so I don't know, uh, let's go back to this side. On the left side, basically there was the wheelchairs, and then under it there's this um, office area, and that's that top area. And then the ceiling was a white space that was kind of like, I thought of it, five minutes? Okay. Um, think about what the most important thing to tell you. I thought of these levels as different, what? Um, I thought of the different levels as kind of like different classes or different ways of being in the world. Um, and the, you sort of like the problem of all of it, because this is just when Trump was getting elected and kind of was feeling like, I've always been really cognizant of these problems and really depressed by them. And, um, but I was noticing that there's a way that you can fall from one class into another one really quickly when things don't go your way. Like you can, like, um, a really quick example is that my, sister's husband got ALS. My sister and her were both working in Midtown at really good jobs, and then suddenly he had ALS, and then, you know, it's like you, she became a caretaker, and then it's like you drop, you can drop really fast into needing Medicare and, or Medicaid and um, being in a totally different world. And I've seen that go all different directions. So anyway, they were like the white, area at the top, which I think you can kind of see here, um, and then there, it's like a walkway that goes across. It's sort of like, I thought of it as like a Trump kind of a um, fancy penthouse or something. And uh, originally it was going to be even more white, right? Like there was going to be swastikas and the vents and stuff like that, but then I felt like I didn't really need to like go all the way there and also I didn't want it to be that simple because it's actually more about like this bad idea of aspirational wealth that we have in the US where everyone wants this even if you don't want to admit it. Like we all want to be, I mean, 
I'm generalizing, but we all want to be in a clean place high up and have a view and feel safe and have a jacuzzi and, you know, like have a nice thing like that. Um, but also that's a total problem because then you, if you have that, then you have to have the people which um, along here, there's like people in sleeping bags sleeping, which was like on the same floor as the wheelchairs. So it's kind of like a homeless shelter or like a hospital or something. And then there's um, an exercise room from a hotel. Um, and then the office there was, I think I have a close up of it. Oh, um, I'll show that to you in a minute. Um, then on the right side, the, the whole welfare, I don't want to call it that, the whole hospital area went all the way around and so did the white rooms. They were like in conversation with each other on the top and bottom. But then under that was this crazy living room, which was like the living room in that fake, flank, fake Frank Lloyd Wright house that I used to have. And there's like, um, we had all these steel case chairs, which were kind of commercial chair that they make in Michigan. And because all of our furniture at that house was from the property control at the university, which is such a great name, property control. But it's like used furniture. Um, and then there's like chicken pot pie there, and or co like copper enameling, and there's mobiles in there that move and stuff. And I forgot to say that there's also lights on every floor that are pointed at mirrors back where you can't see them. And so the lights are like spotlights moving all around, or they look like they're coming through the window and it's car lights moving and stuff, so it's more moody. Then there's like on the aspirational wealth side below it on this side there's this chair that has this amazing view and then there's a mini bar um, and stuff and then below that is um, what the yellow tablecloth is like my apartment now and it's almost exactly what it really is and my apartment's like 260 square feet or something so pretty small and everything has tons of details and there's the um, office, and that was supposed to be kind of like the office my sister and her husband worked, um, or my brother-in-law worked in in Midtown. And I'm sorry, there's music on this one. That's why it was doing that. I'll just play it. And then we can be, I have lots of behind the scenes, but we can just talk. Um. <laughs> get the idea. Um, but yeah, I feel like we're probably, that's a better view of the office. Um, maybe I'll just blow through these and then, this is a better view of that room, chicken pot pie, copper enamel. Um, and then, <coughs> To show the different times of day in the sky. I forgot to say that the sky went like moved under this chair all the time. So it was like the it was like being in space or something. It was like the ultimate view from the space station. Um, and I have a ton of behind the scenes, but I don't know. No. Nah. Yeah. How about I'll go I'll just like go through super fast. Um, this is just like all the parts. And oh, this is the jacuzzi. Oops. Oh, That's the jacuzzi. Um, this is like when we were putting it all up and I saw this. This is like standing on one of the platforms looking over at the other one. And uh, I just thought that was like, I didn't ever realize that the light would do that where it makes plaid. And so then I was like, crap, I should just leave it like this. This is like so much better than my original idea. So anyway, OK. Um. <laughs> Thanks. Just, um, so we can open it up. Toby's going to turn up the lights a little bit. We can open it up to a couple questions, um, if there are any 
out there. Um, so what's with all the jacuzzis? Uh, just I think of it as this, um, it's kind of like a symbol to me of the perceived idea of the good life or um, just it's like this weird um, tension to me between what you need to do to take care of yourself and be healthy and happy and feel good and this weird idea of the of rich um, trying to be rich before you're going to be happy so because I actually really like like a lot like swimming and jacuzzis you know but um, yeah, I guess I'm just like, I don't think with any of my stuff I'm trying to answer a question about, or like even make a value judgment as much as just present the duality of the problem a little. I don't know if anyone gets that. But that's what it is to me. Um, what are some of your like major design aesthetic like influences? Like, what do you look to when you're designing these like rooms? Um, well, I really love those, um, the, just, I used to love to go to the library and go to, I love to go to thrift stores and stuff and those old, like I guess the 70s and 80s design books, like I've always really loved those, but then I've been, or maybe earlier, like, um, you know, Buckminster Full. I don't know, there's so many different things, like I'm pretty interested in architecture, but, um, but the thing is, I've gotten accused at different points for having making things that really look like, I guess, 280s, and I, that really upset me, and I didn't want to be... It was like another thing where it's like, not that, it's just that that is part of a like, subconscious way that I think about things, because I grew up in this land that was like, everyone had, like, a patterned carpet in their kitchen and stuff and you know like the it was really different than that the aspiration of many different patterns all together was so different than like a, the clean aesthetic that some people went to. so I don't know yeah that's I guess but um, our films I've had a number of different people ask about what happens to all this stuff after it's exhibited uh, yeah, it's always different, <laughs> and it's always difficult. <laughs> um, sometimes I've trashed the stuff, like all the things from Rape of the Mirror got trashed pretty much. I have two of the couches in my studio now. Um, uh, the PS1 show, which was the one that I talked about as like piled up consciousness, um, that, oh no, Did I, can you still hear me? Um, that one actually got sold to this Chinese collector, um, like, which was really amazing. Um, and then I remade it in China, but they didn't take all of it. I had to like have some of it remade, and then it was a bit of a disaster because you don't have control over your own work when someone else owns it, and they just had all these rules, and you ended up not being able to look down into it because they built the wall too far over, <laughs> you'll yeah. see. Um, so yeah, and then, um, let's see, to be briefly answer. Um, the one that was at the art fair got bought too for like really little amount of money. Um, and then I got to remake it in London. And I learned that it's like hard to, yeah, it's just hard to remake a thing that you don't, when, you, well, when you're not in the same mind frame. Yeah, so site know? specific. Also. Yeah, or like I needed, I guess it needed to be really tight um, because it was made for this one small space and then I tried to put it in a bigger room because that's the room they wanted me to do it in, and I felt like it just like lost momentum and also I couldn't go all the way there to get everything kind of like, they are a bit like remaking a sculpture a little bit and uh, I just felt like it didn't pick up the same amount. Are those more feeling. permanent or like long-term installations than the re reinstalls? Um, uh, no, not, there isn't anything permanent yet, but I've also had to trash things. Like, though the Whitney owns the one at the Whitney, but that was a really long, crazy negotiation, and I learned, I mean, oh, the business of the whole thing is a total another job, and then, plus I was saying, like, the job, like, there's 15 jobs. 
but um but i fought really hard to make that happen like because i can't really survive even if stuff sells like i mean you know it's not it's hard to make a living yeah so thank you any other questions oh josh you're all the way over there <laughs> And I think we can take one more after this. So if you have one burning inside of you. Uh, it seems like you're really engaged in the process of hand building or hand constructing, although it looks like recently you've had some engagements with outside sources. So I'm wondering if that comes from preference or necessity uh, or from your background. Um, well, if I could, I would definitely prefer to make everything myself. But because I really feel it's in, totally really necessary but the only thing is I have bigger ideas and what I can really do and I also seem to at least in the past never have any time to do it like that Canada show you know it was like it was one month being there to try to pull everything together and so I, I've been so lucky like they hired people instead of me hiring people to help make put together all the chairs and stuff and there's a certain amount of letting go that I think is really necessary that I need to learn about. But I also, I'm just totally conflicted about it, really. And I'm actually like uh, now, you know, just trying to experiment with other materials and other, I like the idea of making stuff that's smaller just so that I can make it. And what does that mean? Because then it's not as much of an experience. And like, yeah, it's actually been, you've hit on my major life question <laughs> sort of but I really love to make stuff like if I could just wear headphones listen to the radio and make stuff all day then I'm mostly happy and I hate managing people like I'm not good at it really either so but everyone's been really nice but yeah does that answer yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? last one we're good okay I think that's it oh wait Mari do you want to do the last one okay Hello. Hi. So you talk a lot about place, and I think a lot of your installation works are about that, maybe external or internal, like kind of landscapes. But I'm curious what the interaction between the viewer and the space that you create is. It seems like a lot of your stuff either shouldn't be interacted with or just doesn't have the capacity to have people like walk in or touch things and that sort of thing. So how do you feel that that interaction um, kind of is realized between the viewer and between the space without your viewers actually being able to immerse themselves fully in the space? That's a super great question. Um, I think it's another question always that I have to figure out through every installation, like the mass murder one uh, that had the couches and stuff on the, it's like people sat on the couches immediately during the opening and broke three of them, you know, because it was like a major party, like that's the way that gallery was at that point. Oops. And um, so then it was confusing to me what to think about that. And then for a while, my answer to this kind of problem was that my I'm fragile, and the things I make are fragile, and it's like a reflection of the fact that like the problem with wanting to touch things and not being able to, and I think I had like a bunch of reasons behind it, and then I started going back to the, uh, my earlier work was all perspectival, and it was like um, you always had the place where you were supposed to be, and then you saw it, you looked into it, but you weren't able to access it. So I think I started going back in that direction because of this problem. But also, like with the Yerba Bueno one, I thought, um, which is the one in the ceiling? Um, sorry, that doesn't take the, um, the 18 different little rooms in the ceiling. I thought of the fact that you can't access any of that and the distance, that was the one that had the biggest distance. And I thought of that as being part of the piece is just this alienating feeling like you can never really understand. And there were a million details in that that you couldn't even see at all through the mirror. So like you'd need binoculars to see the details. 
and I thought that that was interesting that I like, well, just on the funny side, like I always make so many things no one can ever see in the installations and it's kind of like torture <laughs> for myself, but I never really know what it'll be like and I, I don't like to, I think I'm going off um, of the question, but I really like that question and I think the answer is that I, I don't really know and I, I sort of valued making things that I wanted to make over their um, relative importance as artworks that could become commodities. Like, that sounds really weird. But that could become sculptures that people would want to have and be able to take care of and stuff. But at the same time, in some of the installations, which r relates back to your question, I split them up and tried to, like I brought that piano to a fair and someone got the piano, but then it's always a weird question because the piano breaks and then I have to go fix it or I've fixed a lot of my stuff already. Um, but yeah, I, I don't really know. But I also didn't talk anything about all the things I said this thing was gonna be about, which is hilarious. <laughs> but um, I'll, be out there. You can talk to me, though, because I don't want to. You guys have already been sitting here a long time. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samara. Thank you.